Hello there. My name is Patrick, Patrick Vitaturi. I'm delighted to be here today with my daughter, Natalie. Some people have not heard about her, but she gives me a hard time. This is Natalie. But today we're going to talk about grit and tenacity. Because from my era, from the days of independence of Uganda, that's my era, we dealt with the issues with a sense of urgency, a sense of adversity, and we just went through life dealing with what we've got to deal with. The kids of today, her generation, many of you young people out there, you take things completely differently. So we want to bring some insights about the role of grit in your life, the importance of tenacity, of resilience. These are some of the questions I want to ask her. Why this generation, this new generation, whether it's X, Y, or Z, are so wobbly, you're so soft, you don't deal with the real issues, you're always whining about the government, about people, <laughs> Tuyambe, all these kind of things. You've got to deal with what you've got to deal with. We did in our times. So, today, I'm going to take a seat back and listen to the, somebody else's point of view and see how the two can converge. Hope that it's interesting for you. Natalie, over to you. Okay. So, I understand what you're saying and I agree, but it's not particularly our fault. But it is our responsibility to build our own tenacity and grit. And I think it's because of the cycles of society. Because your generation grew up in war and drama and chaos and was volatile, you guys all have like a certain level of resilience just because you've survived so long, because you went through so much. But because you suffered, you don't want your kids to suffer. When I went to school in other countries, my friends started working at 16 or 18. They had to like be independent. They had to do certain things. Their parents wouldn't do everything for them. But my parents would make all my decisions, would help me with everything, would pay for everything. And not just my friends in my school. I know a lot of people who live like this in Uganda, where our parents protect us and coddle us. And we're very grateful, but it's because you don't want to see us suffer because you suffered so much. The downside is we never learn how to do things ourselves. And I've had to go through this myself with my first wobbly, as you call it, when the first time I had to do something and you didn't bail me out, it traumatized me. I was like, what do you mean you're not going to fix this for me? I was in university and that's already quite old to have to do stuff for yourself. So I think it's something that we have to proactively learn because if we just go passively as young people, our parents' generation is always going to be looking out for us, protecting us. And also in negative ways, a lot of jobs, a lot of opportunities are not being given to us because the older generation thinks these guys can't handle it. They're too young. We don't respect young people in our culture. Older is always better. So there's a bit of a, I'm not trying to blame you. I understand why. And it was with the best of intentions. But the downside is when you don't let kids learn how to do things from a young age, they have to learn later. And it's so much harder. And at that stage, they might not be able to, and also they might not have to. I know so many people my age who still live with their parents, who still get money from their parents, who are still supported by their families. Yet at my age, you guys had everything. You were so independent. You were doing everything by yourselves because you didn't have a safety net. You didn't have anyone to ask. But here it's an attitude almost. It's a culture. Even sometimes when I'm in rural areas, they're waiting for an NGO to give them like the solution. They'll give us food, they'll give us money, they'll do this. We don't have an attitude, let me get up and do it and fix it myself. And I also find it frustrating because now I've had to learn that. So I try to teach it to other people. You can't just wait for things to happen to you. We have this passive attitude. The government will fix it. My boss will fix it. If there's a problem at work, you have to ask your boss, what should I do? We don't take that. We're not proactive. We don't fight through things naturally because we've never had to. We've never had to learn those things from when we were young. So you have to learn them the hard way. And as an adult, it's a choice. You can choose to fight through it and learn the hard thing, or you can be passive. It's someone else's problem. We see what happens. Someone else will like deal with it. So do you want to blame His Excellency himself for giving <laughs> you this peace that now all of you are spoiled? This peace that we hold so fragile, that we fought so hard for, we sacrifice and you take it for granted? Now you simply say, oh no, life is like that. I feel what's wrong with this society, your generation, and not just you, the elitist, but across the board. I've been to several universities to talk to them, especially at graduation time. 
and you all come out, whether it doesn't matter your income bracket, you come out with a feeling of entitlement. You are entitled to so many things. You're entitled to nothing. A degree doesn't give you entitlement. It's a, it's a license to give you a, an opportunity. You are now able to say, please give me a chance. Give me that opportunity. But you come out feeling, they must give you a job. We must give you some. Those days are gone. What's the meaning of the word grit? How do you break down grit? Grit is really about your guts. You, what, what is in your guts? Your, your resilience. R is for resilience. I is for your innovation. You've got to be innovative. Try and sort out something. And T is for tenacity. To go the distance. Because you will fail. You will fall down. You've got to pick yourself up. These key words, these key letters that form the word grit, means that strength that you need to succeed. We went through that. Now, I'm not talking only for the elitist. Even the child who comes from the very rural community, not entitled at all, they've really, their parents have struggled, they've sold the piece of land, the cow, the goat to get you to, through to university. As soon as you're at school, you're the leader of the strike. We want to strike. The teachers must do this for us. We want this, we're entitled by the government. You're leading the strikes. Every day the police isn't running battles with the university. What the hell do you think? You came alone. But once you're in a group, you think this mob thinking <laughs> makes you feel so entitled. We are a poor country. We've got limited resources. We've got so many priorities. But you think the world starts and stops with you? And you want a job now, 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 now? That's not acceptable. What do you have to say? I understand that. And I face that also with some of my staff, especially young ones who start working and have no skills and experience but really feel entitled to what they're doing and what they're saying if they're completely off. And it's very hard to get them to listen and to learn. But I think the problem also comes because we are exposed to so much information. We're the first generation in the, like globally that can see what's going on in India, in China. We can watch TikTok, we can Google stuff, we can go on YouTube. And we're also full of, there's so much opportunity. You can be anything in today's world. Back in the day, you had like three or four job options if you had a degree. You had a few job options if you don't have a degree. Now you can be absolutely anything in the world. But you do need the resilience to be able to achieve that. And that's something that young people don't realize. A lot of the women who I coach with businesses, they've started so many businesses and given up. You can't keep giving up. You will never get any of them successful. But it's something even entrepreneurs all over the world struggle with. By the time you see a company in the news and it's successful and it's big, it means they've been suffering for at least 10 years. And that's something people just don't realize. Because you see the success story, you see it on Instagram, you hear, hear about them, you see them with a nice car, you don't know the struggle that they went through. So everyone thinks, I can start a business, and in three months they're upset, where is my car? Why haven't I gotten all these things? Because I think resilience happens in that moment when you're defeated. When you're knocked down and you say no, and you get back up, and you start again, or you try harder, or you take the feedback, you don't just quit, that's when you build resilience. It's like a muscle. But most people, unfortunately, once they're knocked down, oh no, it wasn't for me. Let me try another business, or let me get a job, or let me do something else. And I don't know how we can communicate that to young people. Life is hard. It's supposed to be hard. I don't know why we get this attitude of everything will be taken care of by someone else. Maybe it's the way we were raised, maybe it's the government. I don't think we need war, per se. But we do need something for young people to build that resilience. Maybe we need to be like Tanzania and Israel, where everyone goes through military training as a teenager. Because you just have to go through something difficult. You have to do it, and there's no option. Unfortunately, we have so many options. There's nothing anyone has to do these days. If you don't feel like going, you don't go. If you don't do it today, you'll do it tomorrow. And we have that attitude. So everything is slow and maybe... And there's nothing that's really pushing people. There's motivation. Everyone wants to have money or cars or nice shoes or something. But you can't just have motivation without the resilience as well and the push from the back. That's what I think. Now, we don't have to be like Israel, where everybody has to go for military training. Because not the military necessarily that changes you. It's the discipline. Military training, whether it's in South Korea, it's in Singapore, it's in China, it brings about discipline. Now, what we are lacking in our society is that discipline. Now, do you want His Excellency the President to enforce discipline in your home? He did for the period of two years when he tried to close down the bars and the nightclubs and put us all in this because of, of COVID. It was a very hard decision. But he did it to protect lives. Discipline has got to come from inside. We've got to want it. And without discipline, 
everything else falls. Many people think success is easy, but there are so many variables like ropes you've got to hold, put them together, all these strings, and then make a big strong rope. Now, I think there are about 99 different variables. If you don't have all those variables and get them together and really tie them, then you have a strong rope, then you've not achieved success. And I've been grappling to get all those ropes together. But there's one very vital rope, which if you don't have that string, that one single string, all the 99 others don't work. That one string is called discipline. Without discipline, all the other factors will collapse. So you need discipline in your life. And if that's the one thing that will help you with your grit, will help you be tenacious, will help you with resilience, will help you with consistency, with character, it's discipline. Now, discipline begins from the family unit. The problems we have today as a country, when people talk, oh, everything is about corruption, that's why we're not moving forward. China, in 1985, was a poor country. Uganda, we suddenly came to power in 1986 with his NRM party. We started building from a very low base. The last 35 years, we have made huge, huge strides, but nothing compared to the strides China has made in 35 years. What's the difference? Discipline. From the top, it is structured. A decision is made and everybody falls in line. And they have transformed their country. They have a big problem of population, huge population. And we in Africa, well, we've got 1.3 billion people, fragmented, fractured, disorganized. We can't even come together as an East African community. We can't come together as Ugandans. We're still bickering. And you, the young generation, because you're the majority, almost 65, 70% of the population are young people. You have divided us. All the good work we've done in the last 30 years, because we've tried to get away from the politics of, of, of religion and sectarianism and what, but we're still divided by petty things. We've got to be focused as a country. And I urge you, the young people, and I'm talking to all of you, as I'm talking to you, we've got to find a thing that unites us and put a structure with discipline in it, painted with discipline. Discipline is not something you learn once. It's a lifetime. And it forms good habits, good things that will protect you. It forms your character. And then you will succeed. When individuals succeed, a country succeeds. As a country succeeds, a region like East African community succeeds. We're going to talk about the Africa free, tra free trade, the continental free trade zone. It won't happen without discipline, without structures, without us moving freely with respecting the laws, without being organized. Because the young people feel they've got so much energy, everybody wants to do it on their own. And it's misguided enthusiasm and misguided entitlement. You cannot feel so entitled. And being educated is important. Education is important. But it's not a silver bullet. Mm -hmm. You won't get prosperous just because you're educated. There are enough people with degrees that are struggling, even with masters and PhDs. And they just can't get from A to B financially. Their level of financial interest is very low. So what we need is discipline. That will help. But how we get it across, how do we get that message across to young people like you and beyond, is my question to you. It's a tricky one. It's hard to teach discipline. It's something you have to embody and practice and you get better with it. Because discipline is really consistency. It's doing what you say. It's having integrity and showing up if you said you're going to show up and doing the things when you say you're going to do them. And that takes a lot of willpower at the beginning. But as you get better, as you practice, like anything else, you get better at it. I can't say I was very disciplined when I was a teenager. I sleep too much or I'd go out too much or not do what I say I'm going to do. But somehow over my career, I learned how to show up when I say I'm going to show up. Even if I don't feel like doing it, even if I'm in a bad mood, even if I don't want to go, you learn how to be there and show up for yourself and for the other people that need you. And I think building that consistency has really helped me build some discipline. But I also think with discipline and grit, you need humility. And that's something that we don't have as a young population. That's what the entitlement comes from. When you think you know, you can't learn anything. If you always go with the attitude that someone knows more than you, or you can learn something from them, you, you try harder, you listen more, and you learn, and then you improve. And so I think if you have that attitude, you become more resilient. Because as you're learning, you fall down, you get up. What did I do wrong? What's the feedback? You ask questions. You ask for help. You ask mentors. You ask your parents. But this entitled attitude, you think you know everything. So you don't ask anyone for help. You don't ask your managers. You don't have a mentor. You think your parents, when they talk to you, just roll your eyes. I used to be like that too. I get it. I know we fight a lot, but I do listen. And I do understand as much time as I've spent with you, 
there's still stuff that you say sometimes i'm like oh i learned something today he's never said that before <laughs> and it still happens but i think learning that as well really helped me because there's always something you can learn from someone even someone from a different background from you someone with a different job than you there's always that attitude if you have that attitude for learning and trying and you keep moving forward you build discipline you build the grit it's not something you're just born with or you have you have to practice it and you have to intentionally practice it and think today i'm going to do better than tomorrow i'm going to show up i'm going to do it i'm going to try again okay what is lacking i think is structure hmm. you know when you form habits and people don't understand the power of habits especially the power of good habits good habits and structure help transform you as an individual. Now, the culture of reading has almost died. People don't read. They read for exams, they go to school and they read. Once they finish, that's done. If I, tell, if I was to tell you, what is the common thing, denominator, amongst all rich people, all successful people? Yes, one would say they all have money. Yes, we know <laughs> that. But what is it that is common amongst all of them? They have a book by their bedside. Before they go to bed, they read. Even if it's for five minutes. Whether it's in the morning or at night, you've got to read. If you don't read, you stop learning. You stop growing. Yeah. It's so important to keep growing. And that's how you grow and become prosperous. Now here, we almost lost that completely. From Idi Amin's time, that had gone away. And the culture of reading was left only for schools. You read when you're in a school. When you see people at an airport in Africa, in Uganda, you see people on the phone, on Facebook, or they're chatting, or they're looking for something else to do. Look at that culture on the opposite side. People who live in the Northern Hemisphere. They come to my office. If I'm still in a meeting and they've got to wait, they pick out of their book, out of their bag, a book. Whether it's a novel, a fictional book, they are reading. They use their time well. They are always growing. Now, there are so many self-help books. People just don't read them. The culture is not there. Now, societies that are evolving have begun reading. And I spent a bit of time in Nigeria. Some people were really reading very interesting stuff. And by the time the, the Harvard Review comes out, everybody snapped it, put it up. People are reading the Financial Times. They are in Africa, but they are checking what's happening around the world. On the internet, all this information is available. And that's what they are reading. Here, if you look at TV, most of the time, all the free time on our local TV stations, it's music, yeah. it's dancing. At one o'clock, people are dancing. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day, young kids are dancing. They are promoting musicians. We can't be a society of musicians. I mean, they have their role, God bless them, they are talented, and they are making some money. But we've got to move beyond that. We've got to do research. We've got to think differently. We've got to look for the real opportunities. We've got to solve the problems in our society. The bigger the problem you solve, the bigger the return will be for you. Now, what's even worse is something called the Kruger effect. I don't know if you've ever heard about the Kruger effect. The Kruger effect is when somebody doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing, doesn't know that he doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing. So he's doing the wrong thing. Let's say you want to be a comedian and you are hell-bent on being a comedian. You are not talented as a comedian. You insist on being a comedian. You're boring everybody every time you go on the stage that you are insisting on being a comedian. Now that's what they call the Kruger effect because you get a triple bummy, a triple whammy because you are hit three times doing the wrong thing and you're never going to start. Mm. And unless somebody helps you to redirect that energy, Get out of that space and do something else where you've got some talent. Now, talent is useful. Intelligence is useful. But three times more important than talent and intelligence is a capital D, discipline. Discipline powers over talent and intelligence. Now, unfortunately, many of those who are very intelligent in class, and many who are much smarter than me in class, really intelligent, they made it as good lawyers, as good doctors, as good engineers. They, they, their growth gets capped at a certain level. You rise to a certain level and they are capped. They'll get to buy a house and they get a mortgage for 25 years. They'll probably buy a car, probably get a lease on the car. The kids get to go to school and they are content. But our country cannot grow when we're growing at a GDP of 3 or 4%. Our population is growing at more than that. We need people to do so much more. Those who have got talent, whether it is in sports or in music or what have you, they use their talent and it takes them to a certain level. Now, if they have discipline and talent, discipline and intelligence, they just soar, they keep going because they've got discipline. Now, even we, the mediocre students in school who didn't have that talent, we didn't have the intelligence, 
but we learned the trick of using the capital D, discipline, have kept climbing the ladder because discipline overpowers everything. Now, Bolt was naturally the fastest runner. He had the talent, he had the build, he had the body, and he could do it. But what he lacked was discipline at the beginning. As soon as he got discipline, boom, he went to the top. Number one. The same with Michael Jordan. All these players who do extremely well because of their talent, they have discipline. I was watching the other day a movie, King Richard, I think, of the Serena sisters. A beautiful movie. I didn't understand. And it portrays what the father went through to hammer out the discipline in those girls to make them number one and number two in the world. He required that discipline to the point of obsession with his discipline. It's a movie worth watching if you haven't watched it. It's out there. But that shows you what it takes to go to the top. If you want to, have a, to be a champion, to excel in whatever field, you need that discipline. And my bone with many young Ugandans today is that instead of trying to embrace it and go the race, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a 100 meter race. When you graduate, it doesn't mean that's the, the end of it. Life has just begun. Now you start searching for the opportunities. Now you start building one brick at a time to build a structure that will help you go to the top of the hill. To build that ladder that will take you to the top in the company. To build that ladder, to build a business that's big enough for you to create employment for many young people. Sustainable employment. And do things where you bring planet and profit together. Don't just make profit at the expense of the planet. Especially today when we're so conscious of global warming. So these things will happen. And the secret is in reading. If you can't read today, there are audio books. Mm -hmm. If you can't listen to audio books and concentrate long enough, watch the videos. YouTube has got so much content. I wish I'd see young people saying, oh, I saw this on YouTube, I saw this on YouTube. Many people say, oh, I, I've had one or two of your clips. I've done hundreds of clips, thousands of clips. They've only had one. At least I'm a local person because what I'm trying to do is bring the local content to localize the stories because there's so much content out there, but it's designed for America. Mm. It's designed for Europe. It's designed for China. What is designed for us in Africa, in East Africa, in Uganda? We need our local people speaking up. And that's what I keep trying to do because I see this huge gap. And that's why I've been encouraging you to fill in the gap and do something, especially for the more vulnerable in our society, the women who are being left behind, the being marginalized. So I'm really proud of what you're doing. But we've got a lot of work to do. And we can't do it just the two of us. We need everybody out there to join us and help us make a difference and uplift our society. We can do it together. What we can. Yeah. I remember when I was like a teenager, Uncle Steven drew a diagram for me. He said the problem with your generation, and he drew a piece of sugar cane. He says our generation used to eat the sugar cane from like the part that's not sweet, and then you walk your way to like the sweet part. He's like, your generation is upside down. You eat the sweet part first, and then you get bored. Mm -hmm. And it just, it stayed with me for so many years because we always think in such short term. Like what you're saying about building. Life is long. It's a long race. It's a marathon. You can't just do well on one project and give up. And I think people just don't think in long-term perspectives. Once I was teaching a class on long-term investing in Ibanda, in the rural, rural community. And the first thing I asked them is, what do you think long-term investing means? And they were like, mm, if you buy something and you keep it for like two weeks. I was like, no. Someone is like, three months. And everyone was like, what? And I was so surprised. That's the time period that they're thinking of. Three months is like this wild, wow, so far away thing. And at the time I was in my 20s. So for me, I was thinking five years. That's like a big long-term project. But now that I'm older, I realize life is very long. If you are blessed to have a long life, which is what you want, but you have to build these things. It's not sustainable to do a sprint and it's done or to do well today and it's over. That's why habits are so important because it has to be part of you. It has to be part of your character. The number one best-selling book in 2021 was Atomic Habits by James Clear, which I was so impressed by. It's such a good book. I really love it. He's like the guru on habits and he explains how you build habits and why they're so important. And it's something I'm always trying to teach because if you try to change who you are overnight, it just can't work. How many people said they're going to go to the gym in January and get fit and they're going to go four days a week or five days a week? It's impossible. You can't go from zero to a hundred. You don't wake up and run a marathon. You have to train. You have to practice. You have to like build it in you. And that's also building discipline. 
once you put in the good habits and you get used to doing them every day, you don't even notice that you're doing it anymore. It just becomes part of you and that's how you keep improving. And then it's sustainable and then you can keep going to the next level. Now I've gotten a hold of this, I'm now good at this, how do I get to the next level? Where it just becomes easy. Like the opposite of the Kruger effect. <laughs> where you learn something until it becomes unconscious. You're just doing it all the time. The same triple whammy. You know what you need to know and you're doing it and you're practicing it until you get it to the point where you don't have to put in willpower and effort to remember to go to the gym or to drink enough water or to write that report or to show up for your school or for your work. So I think that's another part that young people need to start doing because the advantage of being young, if you get good habits when you're young, it's so amazing. You'll have them for the rest of your life. It's not like learning them when you're 50. It's not too late, but it's such an advantage if you pick up the good habits and you get that discipline when you're young. Discipline's only hard at the beginning. You need, in the power of habit, uh, the Charles Duhigg book, he said it takes about three weeks to build a habit. So you just need to put in that effort for three weeks. Really, can't you put in effort for three weeks on one thing? Don't try to do 10 things at once. Do one for three weeks till your body is used to it, your mind is used to it. It becomes part of your routine, part of your day, part of the way you think. Then you can add something new. Three weeks is not that much to ask. Why three weeks? change your wiring in your brain I assume Maybe, I, I can't know. remember from the book mm -hmm. but I know with like neuroplasticity in your brain if you do something over and over and over it becomes like the default route and most of the time by the time you're an adult or let's say 18 all the default roots in your mind are from just how you were raised so that's just how you think that's how you act but to add a new thing you have to be proactive about it and push and push and push till you override that old neural pathway so then every time you see something or do something, it happens automatically. Even in the book, he talks about triggers. When you build a new habit, you have to have a trigger and you have to have a reward. So that you know, every time I have do this trigger, I do the habit, I get the reward. Then your brain will learn this is the new system. So every time you have that trigger, you'll start doing it automatically. Like the way you know how to walk home by, by yourself without thinking about it, you don't just put in effort. Or every time you turn keys, you're not thinking enter key, turn key. Your brain and your body knows what to do because that's the neural pathway you've already made. It's why affirmations work. If you say that affirmation every morning or three times a day or 10 times a day for three weeks or for a month, your brain will start to believe it's true and it just becomes your reality because you've rewired it and then it's forever. Then you never have to put in that effort on that particular thing again. So it's like a hack. And I think a lot of people don't know this, maybe because we're not reading, but these are things you can learn online and that's why I love the internet. You can learn this stuff even on TikTok. There are useful channels on Instagram, on Facebook. It's not all music, but it's true. In our culture, everyone wants to sit and watch music videos all day. Yet there's so much you can learn. You type any word into YouTube, you can learn about it. Any topic, any person, and there's so much information, so much inspiration as well. I love watching like athletes, like how you're talking about Michael Jordan. I love like documentaries about athletes because they never get tired of the discipline they're always consistent when you see that kobe bryant practicing you can watch his practices he does the same thing over and over and over you're kobe bryant you know how to do that you can do it in your sleep but he never stops he always said you have to get comfortable with the basics and just keep doing it over and over that's how you stay number one in the world and it's the same attitude all athletes have they train like no one else and I love that because when I feel like I know too much about something or I'm bored of this now, I don't need to research this. Remember, if Michael Jordan kept learning how to do the same dribbles or if Kobe Bryant or an athlete was doing the same thing over and over for 30 years, that's how they stayed on top of their game. Really, who are you to be bored by something? You think you know it now? You have to build that consistency and get used to it so you don't even fight it anymore. It just becomes part of you and that's how you keep growing. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, many Ugandans are not looking for becoming number one in the world. They want to get by. What advice would you give them? Because you've talked about habits. They don't want to be super rich, mm -hmm. but they want to get by. Right now, they feel life has, built, has dealt them an unfair hand. They just want a better opportunity. How do we create opportunities for the young people? How can we make them, how can we encourage them, point them in the right direction? I think the first thing is your mindset. When you start with a defeated attitude of it's not fair, it's because I was born not rich, it's because the government did this, I'm not good at this, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. You will never succeed. I think you have to create your own luck. If you get up every day and say, I'm going to do my best today, what can I do to improve my life? Even something small. 
whether it's your health, whether it's your finances, it's your family, what can I do to improve my life today? Whether it's learn something new, practice a skill, network with someone, do something kind, you have to have that attitude of doing every single day. You need the discipline of that. Because when the opportunity comes, opportunity favors those who are prepared. If the opportunity comes, but you've never read about it, you don't know who it is, you don't know what to do, you'll miss it. And then you'll be bitter. Why did that person get that opportunity? They get all the opportunities. The people who always get the opportunities are constantly working for them. They're always learning. They're always growing. They're always networking. They're always trying. They're asking. They're pushing. That's why they get all the opportunities. It's not luck. You have to do it yourself. And I think when you take that responsibility, your life can change. No matter how small you start, don't wait for the big opportunity. Don't wait to start your business when you've saved so much capital that now everything is perfect. It's never going to be perfect. But start small with the small actions you can do every day to improve your own life, to make sure you're doing something and you get used to being proactive, being intentional. Then more opportunities will come to you. That's what the individual can do. You can't sit there and say, oh, the government hasn't made us jobs. There's nothing I can do about that. But what I can tell you is try what is in your control every day and use that mindset and be positive and optimistic and proactive in what you're doing. We hear it very often. Take responsibility for your life. Mm -hmm. It's only you who can change your life. Your destiny is in your hands. But these people's hands, they are bare. They have nothing. They don't see the opportunity. Some of them have gone through school. Their parents sold the land. They have nowhere to go back to. And now in the past you could live with relatives, but today it's becoming hard and live with a relative indefinitely. They'll keep you for a few days and you've got to move on. What hope do you give these young people? Especially in today, Uganda's environment. People are talking about oil coming. Our country's got so much potential for agriculture. But people are poor. How do we change this still? I understand. And I think many people see it that way with bare hands. But the good thing is you don't have to see the whole plan. You don't have to see everything. You just have to take one step at a time. If you can just see what's the one step I can do for myself this week, for my business, for my life, for my career... You don't need to see the whole plan or see where it's going to go. Because as you take one step and the next step, the path keeps un unfolding. You can't plan everything. You can say, I want to work in oil and gas. But if you sit there and say, I want to work in oil and gas, that's not going to help. Who do you know in oil and gas? Have you read a book about it? Have you done a course in it? Are you qualified? Are you in the area? Are you working in that sector? What are you doing one step at a time, one small, small task at a time? If you think of the whole mountain, you'll never climb. But a mountain is climbed with many small steps. So what can you do for yourself today and see how that goes one step at a time? And that builds hope because the more you go, you gain momentum. You start making progress. You start seeing opportunities come. And when you look back, you're like, wow, a year ago, my life was very different. But it takes those small individual steps, not one big leap. One day I'll meet a rich man and I'll tell him my story and he'll give me 30 million capital and my life will be changed. That never happens. It's just not realistic. But if you do the small steps one at a time and you start that business with your 200,000 capital and within three months, it's now at 600,000. And within the next one year, you're now doing three or four million every month and you're having turnover. The day you meet that rich man, he will give you the loan because you have traction, you have a record, you have experience. And he can see you have the resilience and the ability to keep going and to keep growing so they can trust you. It doesn't happen the other way around. And unfortunately, those are the stories people see or hear, and that's what they want to believe. But it's the small steps and the small tasks, I think, that get you further. Natalie Bitature, thank you very much. That is the one step at a time. People will hold you to that. Everybody, you have heard her one step at a time, one task at a time. Thank you very much. It's been very useful. <laughs> All right, I think that's the end of this show. I'd like, I hope it's been useful to many of you listening out there, watching us. And uh, please tune in for our next show. It's going to be about the work-life balance. So many people don't understand how do you get it right. Because you want to work so hard, you want to succeed, and you've got a life to live. When I say a life to live, to deal with your family. To, be, to do the things you also want to do. To be healthy and balanced and raise children. Watch out for that. It's going to be interesting. Thank you.